So now it's time for our final presentation tonight, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce our own Etna White for this one. So um, Etna qualified as a vet in 1994, and she did um, spend 20 years in mixed practice before joining the Department of Agriculture in 2017. And um, she's currently a superintending veterinary inspector in the National Disease Control Centre, um, which works in the area of preventing and controlling certain exotic disease. I know Etna, we, we, we are a bit uh, iffy about the rural broadband in Wicklow there, but we can see you okay. I'm sure we'll be able to hear you okay by the way the picture's behaving and we can see your screen very clearly. So we'll we'll go with it and I'll let you know if there's any problem and we can turn off your webcam if that if that happens. Okay, thanks Etna, can you take it from here then? Yeah. Okay, thanks Mike, I got you can hear me okay. Um, yeah. Good evening everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk this evening a little bit about biosecurity for non-intensive farm holdings. So whether you have a few chickens, a few pigs, a few sheep, a few cattle, or all of the above, uh, these are just steps that you can take to help protect um, the health of your animals and help stop the spread of disease from one holding to another. So what is biosecurity? You've probably heard various definitions over the years of this term. Uh, essentially, it boils down to two key principles. The first principle involves taking steps to prevent disease from entering your holding. And the second step involves taking steps to prevent disease from spreading within your holding, that is to spread, stop it from spreading from one group of animals to another group of animals. And both of those are important. So what are these steps that we can take? Well, believe it or not, live animals are actually one of the biggest threats to um, spreading disease around the country. Take this picture of a, a very healthy looking lamb here. Uh, that lamb could potentially be carrying uh, resistant worms, for example, stomach worms, which are uh, contributes to the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it be, could be carrying the seropic mite, which carries, um, which causes sheep scab in sheep, or it could be caught, carrying the bacteria that causes foot rot in sheep. And it might display any clinical signs until a week or two after it's arrived on your holding. And by then, it's already spread to the rest of your uh, animals, uh, to the rest of your sheep, particularly if you haven't quarantined this sheep. So animals can carry hidden diseases onto the holding. And that's why it's important to purchase animals from trusted sources where you can. And try and obtain a full history of any treatments or vaccinations that the animals should have got. For example, this sheep should have probably got a clostridial vaccination before you bought it in. The big key thing here is to ask questions before you buy. Uh, and you think of it this way, because it might come naturally, but you wouldn't go and buy a car privately without asking a few questions about the history of the car. Um, so you should take a similar approach if you're buying animals privately. Ask the questions and find out the history. So continuing on the theme of live animals and the risk that they uh, pose to bringing disease onto a holding, there's a few other things that you can do. Um, First of all, you need to register your holding. This is a legal requirement for all farmed animal species that you have. So that could involve a few different registrations. For example, if you have uh, cattle plus pigs plus poultry, you will need to re register them separately. And you can do that by contacting your local regional veterinary office of the Department of Agriculture. You can also register poultry online on the department website. So a second thing then you need to do is to ensure that the animals are properly identified and where movements are required to be notified to the department, that they are notified to the department. Again, that's a legal requirement. And the reason the department likes to keep a track of who's registered and the movements of animals is because it helps us control an outbreak. It helps us trace animals. And that's very important if we have a disease incursion, such, uh, any disease, exotic disease incursion, whether it's avian influenza, in poultry or African swine fever and pigs. We in the department need to be able to look back and find out where those animals came from, or if you've sold animals, where they've gone to. And uh, it also allows us, for example, with poultry, to communicate with, um, uh, with poultry owners. We have a text alert service for poultry owners, which we can send you a text to alert you of what's going on in your environment, or if there's a disease threat in your near environment. Another thing you can do with live animals is to quarantine all of your incoming and returning stock uh, for a minimum of 30 days. Again, uh, let's go back to the example of the sheep in the previous slide. Quarantining that animal would have displayed 
a lot of those clinical signs that we were talking about for the soul's diseases and would have given you the opportunity then to get veterinary advice and treat that animal, thus preventing that spread of that disease to other animals in your holding. And if you're planning to breed animals, ideally use artificial insemination. If you are uh, moving stock around again, you must apply the quarantine rules. And also when it comes to your animal's health, try and familiarize yourself with the signs of illness and obtain veterinary advice from your local veterinary practitioner where you can. It's important to get your veterinary practitioner involved in writing an animal health plan into your calendar if you're not particularly familiar with what you need to do regards vaccination, warming or what any other treatments. And you can use your calendar on your mobile phone, for example, to set reminders for yourself of when you need to administer essential treatments. The key point here is that you need to prepare to prevent illness. Prevention is always a lot more cost effective and obviously better for your animal than treatment. When it comes to using medicines, you need to record all medicines and the withdrawal times if they're food producing animals. This is again as a legal requirement. And it again, it helps us keep a track of what's being used in the country and it helps uh, regulate the entire animal medicine sector, which is a key part of trying to prevent animal microbial resistance. If you have dead animals, um, you should use an approved knackery to collect them in the case of larger animals and pigs particularly. And you should always make sure that dead animals that are on the farm are not located near your live animals. Your live animals can't come into contact with them. And you've got to assume that that animal died of an actual disease and that that carcass would be a reservoir of that disease to the rest of your stock. When it comes to your premises, uh, keeping your premises clean and tidy is extremely important. And I want to just say a few words here about avian influenza because it's particularly important at the moment. Uh, we know that migratory wild birds can carry avian influenza viruses when they migrate into Ireland in the winter season. And when they get here, they can actually spread those viruses to our resident wild bird species and also to our poultry. And it's uh, it's very important at the moment, particularly, to implement measures, whether you've got a few birds out the back or whether you've got a big poultry unit, it doesn't matter. We need to implement measures to try and reduce the risk of your poultry flock getting avian influenza from wild birds. So when it comes to uh, your farmyards, you need to keep them clean and tidy and you need to do disinfect housing and loading areas periodically. You need to ensure that wild birds cannot get access to your poultry. So when it comes to housing or where you keep your birds, make sure that it's secure, that there's no doors open, there's no wild birds flying in and out of the house, that the rooms are leak proof. And if your poultry do need to have outdoor access, then implement things such as, if it's feasible, use bird netting and just allow them out into a small area. And fence the area in which they're going into. Don't let them near ponds or waterways or lakes and always locate uh, their feeding and watering points indoors. Avian influenza is an notifiable disease and you should be familiar with the clinical signs. So sudden death is a clinical sign, depression, uh, respiratory signs like sneezing, coughing, inappetence, stopping egg production and blue wattles and swollen heads. And uh, you can occasionally get nervous signs as well. And if you see any of those signs, contact your local vet or the local regional veterinary office of the department without delay. You also need to use plenty of clean bedding to ensure that accommodation is dry and again, leak proof. And this doesn't apply just to poultry, it applies to all animals. And again, in relation to all animals, you need to have isolation facilities in order to house sick animals on your premises. And um, this goes back to our second key principle of biosecurity, which is to stop disease spreading within your, um, within your holding. So manure should be re removed regularly and preferably stacked and composted because we know that composting raises manure to a high temperature and those high temperatures can kill a lot of um, diseases and pathogens. And when it comes to allowing vehicles um, and trailers, livestock trailers in, in and out of your farm or movements, you need to clean them thoroughly before disinfecting and the cleaning is as important as the disinfecting. But clean and thoroughly, and preferably with your, if, it, if you have a used uh, trailer for an animal movement, do it within 24 hours. Again, this is not to allow uh, pathogens to multiply and replicate in, in the contamination because that's where 
a lot of those pathogens are carried, are carried in fecal dung and fecal contamination from animals. But it also means that your trailer is actually the easier to clean, the dung doesn't harden into it and it's easier to keep things clean and, and disinfected. Use an approved disinfectant as well and use it um, according to the manufacturer's instructions. So going on then a bit more to talk about a bit more about premises and feed storage. When it comes to equipment, you need to thoroughly clean and disinfect the equipment after each use and preferably do not share equipment before farms, between farms again. Um, you need to, as I said earlier, locate feeding and watering points indoors for poultry. Again, this is to discourage wild birds. And fence poultry away from natural water sources that attract wild birds. And don't be afraid to use things like scarecrows or that it's outside if you want to try and distract wild birds from coming near your premises altogether. Ensure that feed is stored securely away from rodents and wild birds and have a rodent pest plan in place. We know that they can carry diseases um, from in, in and out of poultry houses, pig houses, etc. So it's very important that you have a, a rodent control plan in place um, and that you don't leave spill feed lying around the yard because again you're just attracting pests, rodents, birds again and you're going to introduce viruses and pathogens onto your rodent. Now people can actually transmit viruses on their clothes, on their footwear, so it's an important one to remember. Um, at the moment, particularly with AI, avian influenza, and that you should only allow essential visitors to come into contact with animals or poultry on the holding and ensure that they follow your biosecurity protocol. So you need to let them know the rules of anybody essential who's coming on to the farm of what you need them to do. So they should, uh, you should have a disinfectant point here uh, outside of your house at the uh, poultry house at the minute. You should be fresh and clean. Uh, if, it, if there's visible contamination in that disinfectant foot bath, it's not worth it. You need to, you need to empty it in the start again. Um, and you need again to make sure people clean the footwear before before they disinfect it, before they come into contact with animals. Um, ideally on poultry units, uh, it's probably best if you can have a dedicated set of boots and uh, foot, uh, clothing um, to enter poultry houses that are just reserved for that particular purpose, um, rather than using the same footwear and clothing to go elsewhere. And certainly don't uh, move from farm to farm with um, with this in poultry unit to poultry unit using the same dirty clothes and footwear. And I also take hygiene precaution when you're handling animals and birds. So wash your hands before and after feeding animals. It's very important. And use hand sanitizer, which we're all familiar with now, where possible. So um, we've already mentioned the disinfectants there and, and making sure that footwear and clothes are always clean when entering animal areas. So on pig farms, they should ensure a contact-free period of 72 hours for anyone who's coming from an African swine fever affected area of the world before they're allowed to come into direct contact with pigs on your farm. Again, this goes back to the whole issue of being able to be carrying um, inadvertently, unknowingly, uh, the virus on your uh, clothes or footwear. If you're returning from traveling abroad, don't bring back meat or dairy products into the EU. It's illegal, but it's illegal for a very good reason. Um, meat and, you know, pig, pig meat can carry, and pig products can carry um, African swine fever virus, for example. And other types of meat can carry foot and mouth disease, even worse again. So um, it's this is the reason why uh, meat and dairy products are not allowed into the EU. And if you're coming back from ASF affected areas of the EU, make sure that you're only bringing back products that have uh, been officially approved by the competent authority and uh, do never ever dispose of food waste to livestock. To keep poultry at home, you should avoid direct contact with wild birds as they can carry infectious diseases such as avian influenza. So if you come across a sick um, or a dead wild bird in the wild, um, it's best that you don't handle this bird, but just contact your local regional veterinary office straight away, and they will come out and remove the bird and get it and bring it to a lab and have it tested for avian influenza. You can inadvertently, by handling a bird, a sick or wild bird, accidentally reintroduce that virus back onto your own poultry holding. So um, we don't advise that you do that. When it comes to feed, yeah, never feed food waste to livestock. Um, it's again, it, you know, it's illegal. 
But um, and you know, this includes all food waste, like kitchen scraps. It's just it can lead to outbreaks of serious exotic diseases such as African swine fever and foot and mouth disease. So know what you can and can't feed your animals. Um, it's best practice to feed, to purchase commercially produced animal feed from an approved merchant, and always make sure that animals can't access uh, rubbish bins or dis, you know rubbish that's thrown away. Um, if you have any visitors coming onto the holding, let them know they are not allowed to feed the animals. Um, it's just it, it, it's a high risk practice, particularly for pigs, um, and, and trying to keep African swine fever out. It has been uh, known or suspected to have been caused um, uh, uh, some outbreaks in Europe, for example, um, with uh, wildlife, wild boar, um, contracting African swine fever from discarded um, food waste infected that was infected with the virus. So that's just a very um, summary, really, of some of the steps that you can take to try and keep uh, disease out of the holding and to try and stop disease from spreading within the holding. Um, it's, it's just a few practical changes can make a big difference to trying to maintain the health um, of, of your animals and, you know, uh, and, and maintaining their welfare as well. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say. Uh, thanks everyone for the attention. I'm going to hand you back there now to Michael. Thanks very much indeed, Adna. That was that was very good. And um, of course, we're catering for a range of different speakers um, on tonight's webinar. There may be people there with thousands of pigs. There could be people there with a few pigs. Um, but either way, if you have a few pigs yourself and you don't have them registered, or if you know anyone who has a few pigs or a few hens and doesn't have them registered yet, please uh, do try to get them on our books. Um, Etna and her colleagues are not interested in uh, hounding you about the details of how many legs your hens are, are laying or how, ma how many um, you know pigs you butcher per year for your own use or whatever. They just want to know where the pigs are in case there's a disease outbreak. They want to be able to pass on some valuable information on biosecurity and, uh, uh, and, and, and certainly information about how to recognize some common diseases um, and that sort of thing. So there, there's, there's some very good reasons to get the pigs, poultry and other farmed animals registered and I suppose these are some of the messages we are trying to get out through Animal Health Awareness Week, and we hope to make, um, you know, the the the, the sort of uh, animal health status of all our livestock a bit more secure through doing that.